Ephesians. We're looking at chapter 3 for the Agape Feast special. Ephesians, if I can find it. Third chapter, looking at verses 20 and 21. Paul has one of the most interesting ideas for the Christian life that you could probably ever read. Listen to what he says. Boy, I mean, if you need a word of encouragement this morning, Paul sure got it. If there are things that just need to you need to wrap your arms around and get something settled in your life. Well, he's got some good news for you. Listen to this. Now to him, notice that that's a capital H. Now to him who is able to do, look at verse 19. Now to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God now to him, now he's already told you a lot before he even got to verse 20, didn't he? But listen, what, what he says in this first chapter is just powerful, but he, here's how he concludes it. And he does it with an amen. Notice that? I mean, it looks like he's closed his book, but he hasn't. Now to him who was able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. And then he comes back to a benediction to him, to the one who is able to fill you with the fullness of God to bring into your life exceedingly abundant beyond all that you could ask or think. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Watch this to all generations, forever and ever, amen. I mean, it looks like he just closed the book, did it? I tell you, he was apparently so overwhelmed by what the Spirit of God was teaching him in the third chapter. By the time he got to the third chapter, his soul was so filled up that he couldn't even imagine chapters 4 and 5 and 6. And so he has closed it. He had to shut it down and take a deep breath. Because what God had just shown him was so overwhelming. I mean, can you imagine the idea, idea of exceedingly abundantly beyond anything you can ask or think. That's so far beyond the lottery idea, no matter how high it got, could never touch this. What a wonderful concept for the Christian life. And so I thought about this passage. I've been thinking about this passage a pretty good while. This is not the first time I've mentioned this to you. This passage has gripped my soul. And as I look back on the journey that we've had as Doctrinal Studies Bible Church, it's been pretty an amazing journey. And I found this passage expressed the way I feel about it 
beyond all we ask or think. I've lived it. As pastor of Doctrinal Studies Church for the last 44 years, I've actually lived this verse. I have seen God do things that were exceedingly abundantly beyond anything we could ask or think. Let me share a few. Just let me share a few in this hour. As we look at the 44th annual Agape Feast. The journey of Doctrinal Studies Bible Church has been exactly, at least in my life, what Paul stated in this text. I have lived this text out in my life unbelievable, and we're about to do it all over again. We're about to do it all over again, and that excites me. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. What you can't see is that word exceedingly abundantly is one word in the Greek language. And it opens with the word hooper. And he's going to come back and use that word hooper again with exceedingly abundantly beyond. The word hooper in the Greek language is an interesting word because in the English, we use that a lot, at least in this generation and the past generation, super. Everything is super when it's at the top, a super mark, a super athlete, a superman, a superwoman. Everything, when we want to say this is the top of what we believe is the top, we call it super. Would you agree with that? We call it super. The Greeks had a word for that. It was called hooper, H-U-P-E-R. And it's used in this phrase, exceedingly abundantly beyond. What the writer did for you to understand is that when he said super abundantly beyond, he went super, super. <laughs> he took what we would call super, a super athlete, would just be lights out. He went to it. He went, that's nothing. Double that to super. Double that. Whatever you thought would be what would be a super market, a super athlete, a super job, whatever that is, whatever it took to get there, just double it. <laughs> what he's talking about is super, super. We don't have a word for that. Apparently, they didn't either, so they just doubled it up. Super abundantly, super beyond what we could ask or think is what he did. Super, super duper. <laughs> I guess that would be it, Gary. Super duper. I guess that's what, that's what the kids would say. That's for sure. And so... Let, let me talk a little bit about what I consider some of that in our own journey, at least in my life as pastor, in our journey. In 1973, well, in, in 1972, God, in no uncertain terms, told me that I should leave one of the greatest ministries I could have ever been attached to in, in my mind in the world told me to leave it without any sense of security in leaving. I didn't leave it for another job. I didn't leave it for a better income. I didn't leave it. He said to leave it. Because I have gifted you with the pastor te gift of pastor teacher, I want you to go into pastoral ministry and fix the mess we're in by teaching the truth of the Word of God. I want you to go do it on a local level. I said, well, I'm doing it on an international level. Certainly doing it on a national level. I got one of the greatest platforms you could ever hope for. He said, it's not the platform I want. I want church. So, 
Before that day was over, when he put that in my heart, I had resigned for the Billy Graham organization, which I never thought I would ever do in a million years. And I told Rick Hughes, who I was writing with, I'm going to go back home. I'm going to seek the Lord's will. I'm going to become a pastor, teacher of some church. Because I'm going to plant. I know what is wrong with the church universally. It doesn't know the word of God because it's not taught categorically. And so I will go back and I will plant a categorical doctrinal flag somewhere in America. And I will be faithful until I die to teach it. I will do it in one location with one group of people, and we'll see where we go. What is interesting about that, I did that in 72 and formed an organization with Rick Hughes called Teen Crusades and waited for the Lord to find me a church. I interviewed a lot because I, was, I, was, I, I knew a lot of people. With, with the organization I was with. I knew a lot of people. When they heard I was going to go into pastorate, I had a lot of calls, but nobody liked my vision. Nobody liked my vision. They couldn't imagine a teaching church that could do well. I wasn't after do well. I didn't go in, I didn't become a pastor to do well. I... I went into the pastorate to be faithful to what I was called to do, and that was teach categorical doctrine because it caused my growth. So I interviewed a lot. I, I really felt strong about two areas. One was Charlotte, North Carolina. I had a great offer there, and I liked Charlotte. It was a nice, quiet little town back then. I really liked it. And San Diego, California, a group of a cluster of about nine Presbyterian churches out there that wanted to go together and bring me out there. And they knew how I taught, and I had talks with them. They didn't care. They wanted it. So we thought seriously about that, Jane and I. And so we were in a dilemma about these two. I was teaching a lot of Bible studies around the area, colleges and communities in Alabama. A group of, group of college kids said to me, why don't we plant a flag right here in Alabama? Why don't we plant it in Birmingham? That's, the, that's a major area. Why don't we plant it here and just spread out from it? So we prayed about it and we thought about it. 1973. We called a meeting of all these high school kids and college kids to talk about planting a flag in Birmingham, Alabama. We met down at the Presbyterian Church in front of Woodlong High School, if you remember that old church. Chuck Farmer met there. He had an office there. That's the reason we met there. He was able to get the auditorium for us to meet. And so we met there. Unbeknowing to us, there was another group of tapers who had the same mindset about categorical doctrine taught ice on the matter of ice, which I wanted to do. We did not know them. I didn't know them. I only knew Chuck Farmer. And so we met, and that group of kids said, let's plant the flag, Birmingham, Alabama. It was a unanimous vote. Unbeknown to me, there was a group that attended at the same time, in the same place, with the same interest, but were shutting down because they couldn't find a guy. They couldn't find a young guy, or they couldn't find any guy, that they felt uh, could, could do this for them. And some of the people that I was in my group 
knew some of the, their group. So when we got through, their group got with our group and said, we'd like to talk more with Ron because we're interested in joining, merging. We, we were going to disband. We would like to join you. And so we had meetings with them. Uh, and as they say, the rest is history. That group of people, uh, the Pins, the Swans, the Hortons, uh, many others, uh, Peggy and Frank, and uh, I don't know, a large group of number of people, uh, senior people. By that I mean they were established people. We were, we were all, we were, we were high school and college kids. I wasn't, but they were. And so they came, and they, they, they were able to bring us some maturity, uh, both spiritually and uh, logistically for us. And so in 1974, we established a church. We struggled trying to find a name for it, but we, we did finally settle uh, on what we were going to do. And so... The first, the first thing that I had in this, I put on your paper there uh, pretty much uh, about this. I discovered that God is able, I, we discovered God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all you ask or think. I mean, we, we, we weren't even in a place where we could ask for anything. We were just thinking about it, and he, he was answering it, and it was amazing to me. And so we formed ourselves, and we met down there. Uh, under their banner, they had, we're still under their, that banner, that banner of doctrinal studies. They developed that, that name, this group. And, we, and so all we did is when we joined them, we added the idea of Bible, doctrinal studies, Bible church. They were doctrinal study in ink. And so we, uh, we came up with different names. We called ourselves Mackayra a while. We called ourselves a lot of different things. But we finally settled down on that because it just made sense to all of us. And so in 1974, we, we started church down in, at that, in that Presbyterian church uh, with no money, with no nothing. You know, no nothing. But just a real vision and a passion to categorically teach the Word of God, and we believe people would be interested in it. Those who were hungry would have a place to eat in Birmingham. We knew that we were not going to be fast food. We were going to be set down and dine. We knew that. We were not going to be fast food. It's not going to be one of these fast food restaurant churches. We were going to be set down and dine, take your time, and let's grow up. And so we, we did that. Listen to me. We stayed in a community center for seven. They, they turned that church into a community center. We were only supposed to, we didn't know this. We were only supposed to stay there one year. We stayed seven. I don't know how that just God does exceedingly abundant beyond what we ask or think. In the meantime, we, we put a search committee to look for a piece of property or a building somewhere in a, a perimeter of where our people were. Our people were in Roebuck, Center Point, area. They were uh, Pinson, Palmerdale, um, Trustful. And then what we called Over the Mountain. We, there, we had a, a pretty good number of people from Over the Mountain. And we kind of lumped them all in that one group of people. We called them Over the Mountain. I guess that was a common phrase down here. I wasn't, for, I wasn't familiar with it, but everybody that <laughs> wasn't here was called Over the Mountain. And so we, we knew we had to find a place that was easy accessible for people coming in now. We ran across this in 1981. We found this little church that was in terrible shape. This was a building that, Roe, it was called Roebuck, Roebuck, it was called Roebuck Park. It was called, no, was it, what was it called? No, it was, called, it was called Roebuck Baptist Church or something. Robinson, I don't know. Anyhow, it was a Baptist church. 
It had the name Roebuck, and it was a Baptist church. But I know it wasn't Roebuck Park because that was another church. But it was called, it was called something. I don't know. It was a Baptist church, and I don't remember. And they had gone belly up. What this building right here is, this part of the building, this was an academy. This was an academy. Back during the race riots and all that, this, this became a very prominent uh, academy back in the, maybe the late 50s or early 60s. This was an academy. In fact, I got to know when we bought this, we met the family and the first pastor and all that that was involved in that academy. That was an interesting thing. We had people that knew people, and the first thing we know, we met all these people, which was interesting. And the church that we bought this from, it built that little part, that, that what we call the fellowship hall and all that, that extended building there. They had started building that, started building on their own, didn't do a good job with it. It was a mess. Uh, that fellowship hall down there was... Uh, Dirt. Dirt. So, we bought this piece of property for the location. It was just exactly what we needed. It was well situated to people accessibly to get to us from over the mountain and people down a major road over here. Park, whatever that road out there is. All right, that was good accessible to everybody. And so once again, we bought this place, flowed a little loan on it. Guys stepped up, and put money down with the bank, and we bought this little thing because we, we had no money. I <laughs> had no money. And what little bit we could scrape together, they gave it to me. And were they smart to do that? They were really smart to do that because you got to have a feeder. And I don't care what they paid me. Guys are already called by God. And so Jane and I just lived off what they gave us, and they were more than honorable. Listen, they have been, this church has been more than honorable with me. And so, once again, God did exceedingly abundantly beyond all we could think and ask. He gave us this church. So, we set up another committee when we bought the church. We set up another committee to, to restore it, a restoration committee. I, t I told them our priorities is first we take care of the children. So we, the, in the children, first we take care of a good nursery. We got to have a good nursery. Then we start building our educational as, as, as their need. We'll do our, our, our so we did. We, we built this we began remodeling this church. Didn't, didn't borrow one penny. Money we had, we used. Every time we had enough money to build something, to clean something up and make it right, we did it. And then God began to send us people that could actually do the work. And then began to send us people that were really good in construction. Then sent us people that loved what we did. Loved the, loved the fact that we were a church that had a great attitude about people and didn't hold a condemnation attitude about them. Your life is your business. What we want to do is teach you the truth and let God change it. We're not here to, cha we're not here to change your life. We're here to teach you the truth. The truth will change it. And so people just began to roll up their sleeves and began to do this thing. It took us 20 years to put the church in what you see today. It took us 20 years. Took us 20 years. We didn't borrow one penny. And in that 20 years, we were able to finish what we had. We were able to, we were able to pay off our, de our, our debt. We were able to put money into ministry and, and other things that our desire was. Because God does it super God does super exceedingly abundant beyond what we ask or think. And we've been here since 1981, and we've worked to bring this in. In the meantime, God just exploded ministry out of this. He just exploded ministry. 
we, we, we have been one of the most unique churches for ministry. We had a drama ministry that was just phenomenal in bringing people to Christ. You need to know who you are and what you've come from because we're about to make another transition. We're about to do this in another place. We're going to do the same stuff. Because, listen, because God does exceedingly abundantly beyond what you can ask and think. And so here we are in 2018. And we're, we're a church that's always had great outreach ministries. Because we build from the inside. We build from the inside. And then God takes that, that mature people that takes them, expands their ministry. And I say to you today, whatever ministry you're engaged in this church, he's going to expand it in ways you have no idea. You know why? Listen to me. I'll tell you why. Because God does exceedingly abundantly beyond what you can ask or think. And he's already extended your ministry a, a, a lot of ways. And he's about to blow it right out. And I tell you that because it's the absolute truth. We're going to do the same thing we've always done. We're going to go and we're going to build from the inside out. This will be amazing to you. There is no doubt that he wants us to fly that flag in Moody and beyond Moody. I've already looked out there. You got Leeds. Pell City flanks it on the one side. Lead flanks it on the other side. Irondale and Trustful flank it on the other side. Odenville, Margaret, and Springville on the other side. And we're going to rid that. That's called our church field, and we'll reach every bit of it. We'll reach every bit of it. So I want you to understand This church came into existence because God is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we ask or think. And once again, we're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. We're going to do it again. It's not about money. Never has been. Never will be. It's about opportunities. It's about opportunities. What you got to have to have great ministry is faith in an awesome God. Faith in an awesome God. And we certainly are that. We've cer we're certainly a church that believes that we serve an awesome, mighty God. One who in our life can show us the meaning in testimony of what it means for God to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we ask or think. And we're going to do that because God is faithful. I, did, I, I promise you that's what God promises you. <laughs> he will do that. He will do that because he's already done it. We have... History is my point to you today. We have history. This is not something we don't know. This is something we do know. We do know this. We have lived it. For 44 years, we have seen God do this. As a church. As a church body. And we'll do it again. And that's what excites me. I wrote on the bottom of your paper... I'm excited about sharing the 45th Agape Feast with the community of Moody. I'm excited about that. Let us pray. Well, Father, here we are again. Going to go climb another mountain, aren't we? We're going to plant that flag on the top of it. For Jesus Christ. How exciting is that? And how exciting is to have a second generation in our church. Who says yes pastor let's do that. And it doesn't scare them at all. 
And I'm so thankful for that. Phase two. What do you want, Caleb? What do you want? I don't want to retire. I don't want to resign. What do you want, Caleb? I want another mountain to climb. I want to see a second generation live out God's exceedingly abundant beyond what we ask and think experiences of their life. I thank you, Father, for the vision. I thank you for the support of that vision. I'm excited to see it fulfilled in the life of people, not only here, but in Moody. And the cities beyond. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.